very much. I'm very pleased uh, there's such a large attendance. Tony reminded me that just at this time, 200 years ago today, Lewis was riding up to Grinder's Stand. It was the last day of his life, and it was at dusk. Because this is such a serious topic, I felt that I did need to prepare this as a written uh, statement, but I'll try my best to read it uh, well, and then we can go into questions. It's a 30-minute talk. I would like to thank the Southern Book Festival and Tennessee Humanities Council for inviting me and Tony for his introduction. Tomorrow will mark the 200th anniversary of Lewis's death. It's one of the most significant and enduring mysteries of American history. Was he murdered or did he commit suicide, as is commonly believed? 200 years ago today, this was his last day on Earth. He was only 35 years old. He was traveling on the Natchez Trace to Tennessee on his way to Washington, D.C., and had arrived at Grinder's Stand, a roadside inn and tavern located 78 miles from Nashville, where we are today. Sometime during the night, he died of gunshot wounds. Was it suicide or was it murder? After returning from the Lewis and Clark expedition, Lewis was appointed by President Jefferson to become governor of Louisiana Territory. He had moved to St. Louis, the capital of the territory, and was going to Washington to seek reimbursement for bills he had paid personally, bills for printing the territorial laws of Louisiana and other government expenses. Totaling almost $2,500, they were more than his year's salary. He was accompanied by Seaman, his dog, who traveled with him to the Pacific Coast and back, and by his servant, John Pernier. Pernier was not a slave. He was a free man of African and French descent. He had been a White House servant while Lewis was serving as Jefferson's private secretary before the expedition. Pernier was present on the night of Lewis's death. He brought the news of his death to Lewis's mother, Lucy Marks, in Charlottesville, and to Presidents Jefferson and Madison. Within six months, Pernier would also be dead, supposedly of suicide. He died of an opium overdose. While waiting to receive his back pay of $240 from the Lewis estate, we know that Seaman died at Grinder's Stand because a contemporary account said he died at grief, of grief at, his, at his master's grave. That's all we know, and that's why our book was written. The book presents the evidence for why Meriwether Lewis's remains should be exhumed in order to determine the cause of his death. It also presents historical evidence, some 20 documents pertaining to his death that have never been seen before. They've never been gathered together. The last part of the book is my own theory as to who murdered him and why. My co-author is a distinguished fellow of the Academy of For Forensic Science. He is a professor of forensic law and science at George Washington University and has conducted many investigations of mysterious deaths and historical mysteries, including exhuming the remains of Jesse James. Whenever he decides to do an exhumation, he first gets the written consent of family members. Lewis family members wholeheartedly support an exhumation. Starting with Meriwether Lewis's mother, they have always questioned whether his death was a suicide. Over 200 collateral descendants have signed petitions asking for exhumation. They have fat, set up a public uh, they've set up a website and hired a public relations firm. Their website is called solvethemystery.org. They are neutral on the subject as to whether it was murder or suicide and simply want to solve the mystery, as they say. Professor Stars is also neutral. I, however, believe it was murder. 
and I make the case for murder in the third section of the book. After the exhumation takes place, the family wants to have a Christian reburial with military honors at the Meriwether Lewis National Monument and Gravesite. The monument and gravesite is located on the Natchez Trace Parkway on the site of Grinder's Stand where he met his death. In the early 1990s, Professor Stars realized an official coroner's inquest had never been held. He contacted Lewis County officials, the county where the monument is located, and suggested holding one. This modern inquest was held in June 1996 and received national and international media attention. However, according to local tradition, there had been an earlier inquest in 1810, but no records have been located. Tradition has it that the local jurors were afraid to charge the innkeeper, Robert Grinder, and one of his relatives, Thomas Runyon, with the murder. Long lost records may yet turn up. Tony Turnbow, who introduced me, has written a play about the 1810 inquest, which is being performed this weekend in Hohenwald, and which I had the pleasure of seeing a couple of nights ago. The transcript of the 1996 coroner's inquest contains the testimony of 13 expert witnesses, and it takes up the first half of our book. It is the reason for the subtitle, A Historic Crime Scene Investigation, CSI with Meriwether Lewis. <laughs> the forensic scientists are very well known in their fields, and that's for real. Those are very big names in their disciplines. They have testified at thousands of court trials and coroner's inquests. All the witnesses volunteered their time and were only paid for travel expenses. Professor Starr started the testimony to the coroner's jury. Three historians testified one for suicide, one for murder, and another examined the state of Lewis's finances. A geologist discussed the geology of the grave site. An expert on the psychology of suicide, a former homicide detective who had investigated over 2,000 deaths, said that in using a psychological profile, he would investigate Lewis's death as a homicide. Two documents examiners declared that a crucial piece of evidence for the suicide theory, the so-called Russell Statement, was a forgery. Two medical doctors testified about analyzing the path of gunshot wounds. A firearms expert gave a demonstration, firing off a 69 caliber black powder pistol, the type of weapon that Lewis would have, was carrying. One expert testified he believed Lewis was suffering from advanced syphilis and had shot himself in a fit of mental derangement. A current biographer thinks that Lewis shot himself because he was in the middle of malarial fevers. And finally, Dr. William Bass testified. He is called the father of forensic anthropology. He founded the world-famous University of Tennessee Forensic Anthropology Lab known as the Body Farm. Maybe it's not a coincidence that the state of Tennessee has pioneered in forensic anthropology, considering the role that the mysterious death of Meriwether Lewis has played in the state's history. At the conclusion of the testimony, the seven members of the jury delivered their verdict. They asked the National Park Service to exhume the remains of Meriwether Lewis to determine the cause of his death. The Park Service, which has jurisdiction over the monument and gravesite, refused to grant permission and blocked subsequent appeals. That's where matters stood until recently when the family mobilized to try once again to have an exhumation, followed by a Christian reburial with military honors at the gravesite. This year, the family was allowed to submit an application to the Park Service, and currently technical reports are being submitted. When they are in, then there will be a hearing over whether there should be an exhumation. If uh, the Park Service grants permission,